I am delighted, just deli I can't tell you how delighted I am to be here this morning. I was trying to remember last night, when was the last time I was in the Netherlands? I think it was 20 years ago. I know, Wait, where does the time go? Way too long a time, but I just really enjoy this country. Gonna have to get back here uh, again soon. Uh, and I've really, really been enjoying the thought-provoking, stimulating conversations I've had already, which is one of the things I'm really looking forward to in this time that I have with you. Last night we had a very interesting conversation, and this morning I've already had a chance to engage with some of you and share some thoughts and listen to what's happening within your own culture and context. It's really fun. And this morning, I, I also love fall. You know, I live in the tropics. I'm from Singapore now. I've been there nine years, so I live on a tropical island. So whenever I get stressed, I just say, hey, I'm living on a tropical island. You know, life is good. But it's 30 to 35 degrees there every day of the year. So, and fall is my favorite season. So it's nice to be here and enjoy the colors of the trees and the cooling air, which feels very cold to me now because I've gotten used to heat. So I come here today to tell you that I was wrong about the profiles for the gifted that we proposed 25 years ago. The profiles was a theoretical typology that we had developed to distinguish among six different types of gifted children based on their needs and their feelings and their behaviors. And its aim was to facilitate the task of identifying and guiding gifted children across all aspects of their development with the purpose of moving people away from this homogeneous idea, this idea that gifted children are a homogeneous group, to an idea of that they're more diverse, that they're actually a heterogeneous group. And the typology became very popular around the world as a teacher training tool. We never intended it as thus such, but that's what happened to it. However, in the last 25 years, since the first version of it came out, there was considerable empirical research that indicated that while we were right about a few things, we were also wrong about a number of things. And I became, began to get very concerned that people were still using this tool that was inaccurate on a number of things. So three years ago, we revised it to align it better with the current empirical research about what we know on gifted and talented children. So today, I don't have time to cover all the changes with you, but I just want to highlight some of the major changes that I think have the biggest implications for educational intervention. And I'm going to ask you to think this through with me. As we think through together, I'd like you to reflect on your own teaching practice and ask yourself, what can I take from this that will improve my support or my services with gifted children? or their parents or their teachers, whatever group that you happen to, um, to work with. So let's start with uh, the type ones. Now, 25 years ago, we said that type ones were the most common child in a gifted program. They were the ones who are usually identified as intellectually or academically gifted, and they were in gifted programs. More is known about this group than any other group of gifted children. But today, I'm here to tell you, I wonder if these kids even exist anymore. Okay? So let me tell you why. We suggested that type 1 children were, as a group, uh, well-behaved, achieving, uh, adjusted children who had learned the system and that they were motivated really just to get a good mark, to please the teacher, and not do much of anything else. We thought they were just doing the minimum to get by. We called them successful because although they were achieving, they weren't making uh, much initiative or responsibility for their own learning. We thought they were perfectionistic, risk avoidant, dependent kids who really did only what the teacher told them and not, mo not much more. But was there any evidence that actually confirmed this? Well, here's what we know. There isn't any evidence that these children are anxious, at least not clinically, although lots of parents and teachers are concerned about the stress that gifted children are under, but really there's not much evidence that these children are particularly overly stressed. The data doesn't support that. They are a perfectionistic, but here's the reality, people. Perfectionism is a lot like cholesterol. There's a good kind and there's a bad kind. Maladaptive perfectionism and adaptive perfectionism. And what the research tells us, there's quite a few studies on perfectionism in gifted children, is that most gifted children are perfectionistic and most, at least 75% to 85%, have the adaptive kind of perfectionism. Perfectionism is not a problem 
for most gifted children. And perfectionism is common in the other profiles as well. So it wasn't something that really distinguished the type ones. Now, so we, in, generally, we found this profile more difficult to support empirically than any other profile. But this is not surprising, I think, given how much the educational landscape has changed over the last 25 years. In many countries, the kids who are now formally identified for gifted programs and participating are quite a different group. They're a much more diverse group than they were 25 years ago. Many countries are identifying a lot more disadvantaged kids in their program. They're identifying culturally different kids. They're identifying twice exceptional kids. So I think what's really changed is the type of child that's in a program. Now let's look at this group just a little bit uh, more closely uh, for just a minute. Let me see if I want to go forward. I'll come to that and I'll go back here for a minute. Okay, we said that they, these kids had positive self-concepts, for example. Now, there has been a lot of research on self-concept in gifted children, and we do find that as a group, generally, they have a positive self-concept. But one of the things we know now is that self-concept is really influenced by a lot of factors, one of which, very importantly, is educational placement. And we do see a decline in self-concept under certain conditions. For example, gifted girls in some Western developed countries will experience a decline in self-concept during the early part of adolescence. So they start out with very high self-concepts and it declines over time. Boys do just the reverse. They start out with lower self-concept and it increases. So boys gain in self-concept, whereas girls during adolescence tend to lose in self-concept. Also, your educational placement makes a difference. If you're a big fish in a little pond, in other words, if you're a gifted kid in a mixed ability classroom, you tend to have a pretty positive academic self-concept, no surprise there. But if you move, you transition into a self-contained or a high ability grouping, your self-concept might take a temporary drop. It does decline. However, that seems to rebound within about a year to a year and a half. So I think the big, the big takeaway is that educational placement and your gender and your age makes a difference in uh, your self-concept. So in the field, we're really debating how important educational placement is in relation to self-concept. You know, does it matter that your self-concept declines? Some people would say it does because that predicts your effort and your achievement level, so it's a concern. Other people would say, no, it, isn't it good to have a realistic self-concept, to know that you're not the star, that there are people out there who are better than you? Isn't it useful to have an accurate self-concept and not have it be overinflated? So, you know, the debate continues. Our idea that gifted, the type ones were going through the motions of schooling or that they've lost their autonomy and creativity are really difficult to support empirically. And George and I have discussed this at length. What we think today is that maybe these are kids who are complacent about their learning. They're not indifferent, they're just complacent. They're too easily satisfied with satisfying the teacher and earning a good mark and they don't take any initiative beyond that. They're really not invested in developing their own talents. They're just concerned about what is my mark. But maybe if they haven't had access to a challenging curriculum, maybe they haven't really learned how to challenge themselves. Maybe they have no experience with what it's like to have a challenge uh, in the curriculum. Now, regarding home and school support, we know that the most important intervention, the most important intervention for gifted children is an appropriate level of challenge in the curriculum, academically, socially, and emotionally. It's very important that they have an appropriate level of challenge. And you know from Vygotsky what an appropriate level of challenge. That's what you're ready for, but haven't mastered yet. Okay, that's the gap. What you're ready for, but you haven't mastered. It means that you have to reach, but you have enough support to make the grab. And what happens for lots of type 1 children, particularly in Western countries, is they don't have to reach at all. Not till about they hit upper secondary or university. They just coast along. So that, that's a really important uh, support to have that. But creating challenge for those children is a problem in many schools and across the world. And oftentimes it's parents who have to look for some kind of challenge for their child outside of the school curriculum. Fortunately, nowadays, with the online services that we have, it's very possible to find very good quality, academically challenging, talent development programs, academic programs online 
for children at a pretty reasonable cost. Not for disadvantaged kids, perhaps in their families, but certainly for middle-income families, you can find that level of challenge. And I often refer parents who, uh, kids who the kids don't have that kind of challenge in the curriculum uh, to those online sources. Now, since moving to Asia nine years ago, I have asked myself whether the type one kids really exist uh, in collectivist societies. Um, and the reason I'm wondering about that is because when you get, Asia's a very large region, obviously, but when you get to many collectivist societies, there's so much emphasis on effort in schooling. You would be, you'd be appalled, frankly, at how hard kindergartners and primary one kids work in many Asian countries. It would just, but from your own cultural perspective, you would find it kind of appalling. Uh, but it's the norm there. So this idea of being complacent about schooling, nobody's complacent about schooling in, in many Asian contexts or many collectivist societies. Parents and teachers collaborate very closely together and they work those kids very hard. Those kids really work very hard. So I think my tentative conclusion is you do find the type ones, but I think they're probably in the, not in the gifted program, they're in the regular um, classroom setting. Now let's go on to the type twos for a moment. Now, George and I call these kids the divergent gifted children or the challenging gifted children. Privately, no, I'll tell you privately, I won't, because I'm being videotaped, I won't put this out there on public. I'll tell you later what we called them between ourselves. Uh, but now, so, right, we called them the challenging gifted, and we said they possessed a high level of creativity. Now, 25 years later, what we're saying about these kids, we think these, this profiles the creatively gifted child. These are the creatively gifted child. There's a huge literature on creatively gifted persons, but very little of it talks about kids. Most of the research is done with adults. There are a few studies, Chicksett Mahai's work on flow and his work on talented teenagers that was published back in the 90s as a very nice study about creatively gifted children. Benjamin Bloom back in the 80s included some creatively gifted children in their study. In the expertise literature, you find some information about creatively gifted uh, talent and its development, but most of the research is on adults. So we have to extrapolate a bit, little bit and see what we can pull from that. And most of that research focuses on the personal traits, the creative process and tasks, and the problem-solving styles or accomplishments of different kinds of personalities. Uh, there is a creative personality. And the literature contains many lists of characteristics of creatively gifted people while acknowledging that we're not saying that every gifted creatively gifted person has all these characteristics, but there's, there's quite a list of them. And these lists typically contain both positive and negative traits, which is kind of interesting. There's sort of a polarity there. They say creatively gifted people are energetic, uh, but they're also introverted. They're um, at rest, but they're also aggressive. They're playful, but they're focused. They're persevering, but they're kind of insecure. So we see this sort of dichotomy sometimes of characteristics among creatively gifted people. Uh, one of the things that has changed a lot about this particular um, profile is identification. Recent research on the concept of creative style has tried to improve on the dilemma that we've had for many years on how to identify creatively gifted children. What is creativity, right, and how do you measure it? They've improved the situation by changing the question from asking how creative is this person to in what ways is this person creative? And this has really changed the nature of assessment for creative potential. So as a result, the focus has shifted from creative achievement to creative potential, making the search for creative giftedness a lot more inclusive. It's a lot more inclusive. Ed Selby and his associates in 2005 suggested that creative uh, abilities could be categorized on a continuum from uh, not yet emergent to emerging, expressing, and excelling. And they noted that each level of creative potential called for a different type of pedagogy. So this idea of understanding style can perhaps help students to use their creative strengths more effectively and also mitigate the risks that are associated with their style when responding to the environment. Now, something I think you would find very interesting 
is that regarding home and school supports, I think you'd want to know that a consistent conclusion, not, not always, I'm not saying this is true, now don't get offended when I tell you this, okay? Uh, it's not true of everybody, but it's a pretty consistent finding that teachers on the whole dislike the traits that are associated with high creative potential. I know in, in Singapore I've gotten complaints uh, from kindergarten teachers who don't like how many questions this really bright child asks in the classroom. They find it disruptive and it gets in the way of their lesson planning. And they want me as a psychologist to do something with the parents and the child to get the child to quit asking so many questions. You know, we don't need empirical data to tell us that if a teacher doesn't like you, and if a teacher has a conflict with who you are fundamentally in the classroom, that you're not going to feel safe in that environment, and that's going to interfere with your achievement. So key to home and school support is really valuing who the creatively gifted person is. And when because they're going to take some risks. One of the things we know about creatively gifted people is they tend to up the ante. As soon as people kind of accept their novel ideas and they're doing pretty well with it, they up the ante. They keep moving to the edge of things, which makes people, you know, their families and teachers a little nervous sometimes. But that tends to be what they do. And we know a lot about the environments that promote talent creative talent from Bloom and Chicxet Mahai as well as many others. And it's clear that the environment, the environmental factors make a big difference. Now today I don't have time to go through with you all the environmental factors. I can just touch on a couple. But these supports, here's the, here's the takeaway that I'd like you to, to remember. And that is that they are domain specific. Okay, so there's big differences between how you develop creative ability in science, for example, and how you develop creative ability in music. That you can't generalize from one domain to another. They are really quite different, the kind of supports, and also the age at which you provide certain kinds of intervention. If you've got a child who's musically very gifted, you start a lot earlier with your intervention than you do, say, with a child who seems to have creative potential in maybe mathematics or science. It's a different trajectory for talent development. So you really need some content specialists to help you with that. All right, let's. Let's go on to another type. The type three profile, the underground gifted child, is not just for girls anymore. When we first conceptualized this profile 25 years ago, we were thinking about girls, adolescent girls, because we saw this phenomenon, particularly in Western societies, where girls, when they hit early adolescence, or sometimes younger, they would begin to experience this conflict between their need to achieve and their need to belong. There was this tension within them. And what some kids, not all, but what some kids were doing is they would deny or minimize their abilities in order to try and reconcile this dissonance that they were feeling internally between this, in this tension, right, between these two needs. But today, we conceptualize this profile very differently because in the last 25 years, there's been a lot of research in sociology in particular, and multicultural education, that tells it that this phenomenon is much broader than that. This whole idea of experiencing attention and feeling pulled between your need to achieve and your need to belong is characteristic of a lot of different kinds of people, but particularly people from disadvantaged backgrounds, people from certain cultural groups, uh, certain kinds of boys or girls. They, what happens is they associate certain achievement behaviors such as earning good grades, getting on the honor roll, getting admitted to the university, uh, winning some awards, as a betrayal of their social, cultural, or racial group. Okay? It's, it's kind of perceived as a betrayal. So I'll give you a ex concrete example to illustrate. You might have, uh, in a Western, this would never happen in an Asian context, but in an, uh, the example in the uh, Western context might be a working poor family who has a very bright child who is dreaming of university. And the parents might directly or indirectly give the message, there's no money for that. So don't even think about it. Finish your schooling and get to work. You know, there's lots of good jobs. The university degree is no guarantee. We see that nowadays. And they kind of put the kibosh on that child's ambition for a higher level of achievement. So now the child is torn between, you know, belonging, getting approval from their family, their parents, and their uh, social group versus their own desire to achieve at a higher 
level. So type threes struggle not only to determine what it means to be, say, intelligent and female, right? Because the world gives girls messages, be smart, but don't be too smart. Uh, you know, be ambitious, but don't act like a man. So you're supposed to be sexy. Girls in the Western context are supposed to be sexy. You're not supposed to be so smart. Smart and sexy aren't portrayed so much in the, in the media. It's getting better, but even there, you know what I'm talking about. But you also have boys who struggle with the message of what it means to be creative and male. Express yourself, but don't act gay. Right? You know, so where, well, where is that line exactly? Uh, or they might, some people might feel torn between expressing pride in their culture, but also reconciling their aspirations for upward mobility. So how, how are you true to your group and also true to yourself with your own? So that's what we're talking about with the underground gifted. Any group of young people who is experiencing this dissonance between their need to achieve to whatever group it is and their need to belong. So they feel some pressure to reject their achievement behaviors in order to belong to their social group. Okay, so there's been a lot of concern about identification with this particular uh, profile underrepresented gifted children, who not all underrepresented gifted children are type threes. And again, context makes a big difference. If there's anything I've learned after nine years living in Asia, it's how important culture and context are. And maybe I'll have a chance before we close today to comment about that a little bit. Uh, but several investigators have found the effectiveness, have studied the effectiveness of various tools and made some recommendations. So let's take a look at those for a minute for identification. For instance, we know that for this particular profile, standardized tests are often poor predictors, poor predictors of academic success among economically disadvantaged students as well as among indigenous children groups. Okay? So we, uh, but a lot of us rely on standardized tests to identify or screen, and yet they're poor predictors. And findings from several studies have suggested, and you may be familiar with this, uh, nonverbal measures that are not so loaded uh, or not so biased culturally, like the Naglieri or the Ravens. Now, there are issues with that, because if you use a nonverbal measure to identify children, but your program is largely verbal, then you risk the possibility of identifying kids who, whose strengths are not in the area that's going to fit with your program delivery or your intervention. So that creates some issues as well. So we want to increase the numbers of representation for this group, but then we want to make sure that we have a program or supports that's going to develop their talent. But interviews, performance-based assessments, uh, nominations, peer nominations, parent nominations, inventories, et cetera, et cetera, might be considered as identification tools, although need to be careful with parent and peer nominations, depending, again, on your context. Uh, peer nominations might not be so helpful if your peer group tends to not have good representation of the kinds of kids you're trying to nominate, and research tells us that some groups of parents are much better nominators than others. For instance, the problem that we have in Singapore and throughout Asia is if you use parent nominations, every single parent would nominate their child for the gifted program. Everybody wants their child in the gifted program, and they work very hard to make sure to try and get their child in to the gifted program. But in other contexts, like in America, Hispanic families do not want their child in a gifted program oftentimes, and they will not nominate their children, even if they think their children are eligible or are, in fact, capable. So I don't know what groups in your culture that might be, but this is something that we have to be mindful of when we try to develop identification processes for this particular group of gifted kids. We have to consider what our local context and our cultures are and develop processes that really reflect the realities in the setting that we are in. I need to keep that in mind. Uh, intervention efforts for resolving these affiliation achievement conflicts, if you will, have not been s systematically evaluated. But there's just a handful of studies that do point to some direction. So here's, my, here's what I've kind of summarized with this, is that we want to first normalize the process, make it explicit. It's going on internally with children, with young people, even adults. Let's make it explicit. This is a societal phenomenon. The society, some groups are going to give you mixed messages about who you are. The world does not always appreciate talent. Some people are jealous of your talent. Some people misunderstand your talent. Some people are ignorant of talent. 
They don't know what it means. So let's step back and just look at, let's critique the kinds of messages that the media gives, that you hear on the streets, etc. Normalize the dissonance the child is feeling. Include cultural brokers in your interventions. Cultural brokers is a term used to refer to people who have successfully no negotiated two or more cultures themselves. And by culture, I'm using the term very broadly. I'm not talking just about uh, ethnic culture, but also class culture. Uh, and um, ethnic culture, racial culture, religious cultures, etc. Because all those different contexts send messages. And the cultural brokers will understand the symbols in the various cultures and help the child build bridges uh, across those. And then provide direct instruction in the social skills that they will need in order to negotiate two or more social terrains, if you will. What you, how you behave in one context is not the same as how you behave in another context. And I I've personally have had a lot of experience in my own life just recently moving to Asia. I mean, you can imagine, I live in a pretty, I live and work in a pretty Chinese society. It's not as China, Chinese as mainland China, for sure. And I've worked there a couple of summers, so I, I have some experience with that. But Singapore, in the university where I am, is quite a Chinese kind of dynamic. And I wondered after six months of working there if I would even know who I was at the end of my stay there because I was changing so much trying to adapt. And I noticed that when I visited my husband well, who was working at the American school, and I didn't get there very often, but wow, I just sort of relaxed. It was such a relief to go someplace and be with people whose culture and expectations and the way they communicated were so much more familiar to me. And I had to mentally really work hard to understand how I need to behave in the Asian, this Chinese context, in order to be successful with there. There were things I absolutely couldn't do, and there were things I absolutely needed to do in order to have influence and succeed. So that's what I mean about te being explicit with the social instructions um, that we need. So any activities that help these kids identify or clarify their beliefs and their ideas, their uh, recognizing these explicit and implicit expectations that people have will be helpful. And any direct instruction in social skills uh, training for this will also be useful for them. Okay, so in summary, let me just finish up the type threes by saying that it seems that home and school supports for this particular group should be organized around regular discussions about class, race, identity and achievement, and around the direct instruction of coping strategies for negotiating these different contexts. And they benefit in particular from conversations that make explicit the implicit social geography of achievement across contexts. Even reading and reflecting on the accounts of various people, fictional or true, who have struggled with this, particularly accounts where people are real about the struggle and what it's like. I like to use movies, uh, several movies that come to mind. Uh, they're, they're still good, they're a little bit older now, but Finding Forrester is one, Bend It Like Beckham, the story of the Indian girl who wants to be the soccer player and her family is just, you know, they're preparing for her marriage, her arranged marriage, and they don't want her going out for soccer when she's a teenager, or Michaela and the Bee, about the spelling bee, the little um, African-American girl who's a very good speller but comes from a more working class kind of background and f experiences quite a bit of uh, negative feedback because of her achievement. Uh, Billy Elliot's another one we're all familiar with. Any story or account, fictional or otherwise, that really makes explicit, here's what it's like for some people to try and do what they feel called to do, I think will be useful. Okay. Let's talk about the type four. In 1988, we described the type fours as dropouts, but we believe that a more accurate moniker for this group now is at risk, because they're not only at risk for dropping out, but they're also at risk for substance abuse, criminal behavior, suicide, aggression, etc. So this profile includes your gang members, your addicts, those kids with serious emotional and behavioral issues. When we, so this is a very small group. This profile is not the majority. There's no evidence that these kids make up a larger percentage in the gifted population than they do in the regular population. It's similar. It might be a little bit less, in fact, but at the very least, it's no more than it is among other groups. When we first talked about this profile 25 years ago, we thought that one of the big 
influencers or factors contributing to their dropping out, their being at risk, was due to the mismatch between their needs and their abilities. But uh, we no longer think that's the case with this. Uh, it's a possibility, but really when we look at the empirical research on this particular group of kids, really there's pretty robust evidence that the reason these kids are like this is due to family and personal characteristics. These are kids whose needs for safety and structure have not been met and typically by the time they get to be an adolescent they're quite angry and resentful and often have deficits in their skills. There isn't any evidence either that these kids are identified any later. I think it's more likely that if they were identified they just don't get included in the program because they have so much difficulty and they end up getting referred into other types of remediation programs or therapeutic programs, etc. But we have been able to elaborate on this group um, quite a bit more, and I think I have time this morning to tell you what the two yeah, I do to tell you what the two groups are. So within this profile, there are actually two categories of at-risk children. The larger category are those children who are pro-social. Okay? They're pro-social. They subscribe to the norms and the moral values of general society. There's a much smaller group that's antisocial. These are your budding criminals. You know, criminals don't just show up, and as adults, they grow up. And there's good research to say that you can actually identify some of the precursors to anti adult antisocial behavior as early as preschool, as early as preschool with some of these um, kids. So. Let me first talk about, well, let me just talk about the group as a, as a general whole, and then I'll try to distinguish those two subgroups. So type four students are kids who uh, create crises and cause disruptions. Although they represent a fairly small percentage of your school population, they use up a lot of resources and people spend a lot of time. Those of you who are working at the secondary level, I know most of you here today are primary, but those of you who work at the secondary level, you know that your school administration spends an inordinate amount of time with a small group of kids who continue to revolve through the door uh, of the discipline office, whatever, however you handle that, due to their repeated infractions, right? They repeatedly break the rules. So these are kids who express indifference toward what others think. They're very skilled at telling people what they want to hear. They use their intelligence to avoid, uh, minimize, deny, manipulate, control. Um, they're very reckless and manipulative. They're engaged in thrill-seeking kind of behavior. And they're often described as troubled or angry or acting out. And Tom Bratter, who unfortunately passed away quite suddenly, I think just a couple of years ago, he was a clinical psychologist who ran a special school residential school for these kids in particular in the United States and he's done some writing on what he learned from his own experience and he I like some of the things that he concluded me because I've, I've done some of that work myself and his work really resonated with me but he said that these are kids who are in some kind of psycho spiritual crisis I thought that really resonated as true these are kids who are in some kind of psycho spiritual crisis usually surrounding basic issues of identity shame and typically overwhelming feelings of outrage overwhelming feelings of outrage they can't articulate why they're so outraged but when you get the developmental history you can see what has contributed to that outrage they're also often depressed many of them are depressed as well in their analysis of gifted dropouts from a large uh, data set from a large national longitudinal study in the United States, Renzulli, Joe Renzulli, and one of his colleagues, Park, in 2000, said that they found five characteristics of type 4 students. They said they had instability in the home environment, negative attitudes toward authority, a lack of an appropriately challenged curriculum at school, poor social adjustment, and insufficient communication between home and school. So in terms of home and school support, you have to differentiate the two groups. They need safety and structure, and this is a group that's typically going to need professional mental health help. Okay? They're going to need professional mental health assistance. The school is not going to be able to do enough for these kids. They're going to need to either be in, they're going to need some kind of therapeutic support, at least for themselves, if not also for their families. But the literature points to the importance of holding the kids accountable Sometimes because we love them and because teachers are such a caring, compassionate group and when we hear their stories, our hearts are pulled and we're full of compassion for them and we want to make things a little bit easier. Be very careful about that. Be very careful about not holding them accountable. 
ideally you want to hold them accountable you can be empathic you can be supportive you can have compassion but you need that safety and structure otherwise they're not going to trust you and they're going to question your own integrity are you going to be another adult who doesn't want to be responsible and hold them accountable because that's what grown-ups do for kids is you put boundaries in place and you hold them accountable and you help them become everything they can be when you hold the adolescent accountable it helps rebuild their self-respect it helps rebuild their self-respect and it demands personal integrity and ultimately that's what we want now be careful too because uh, lowering expectations sometimes parents in particular but also teachers I've seen do this it's very tempting sometimes to lower expectations the child's failing in school or doing very poorly so you know what he's really can't handle the gifted program or he really can't handle this advanced curriculum. it's too hard for him he's not doing well enough here let's put him and I say him because most of them are boys although there are girls let's put him in an easier setting where he can have success now why is that a bad idea what are you saying to the kid when you do that? Yeah, that's right. You can't do it. I have no confidence that you can really, that you're really capable of this. Now, I'm not saying never do it, because I, mean, I, I have myself as a clinician recommended on occasion that a child step out of accelerated advanced coursework for a time because they, they need the time and the energy to work on some other things. But be very careful about lowering expectations or moving kids out of challenging curriculum because that's what makes life worth living for some of them and these are kids who work for a person not a grade they work for a person so somebody who will hold them accountable and also have very high expectations for them is going to keep them engaged and that's what you're going to need so type 4 students generally respond to confrontation I'll come to this in just a moment. They respond pretty pos positively to confrontation, telling the truth in love, if you will. And certainly they, they need empathic support, but failure to confront them and hold them accountable tends to, prevent, tends to prevent the behavioral change that you really want. Now, one of the reasons people don't do this is because it's a lot of work. I mean, if you've worked with some of these kids, I've done therapeutic foster care in my home. My husband and I, for 10 years, we had seriously, emotionally disturbed teenagers, some gifted, some not, in our home full time. And oh my gosh, it's very tiring, <laughs> right? And maybe you're in a setting where you've got quite a few of these kids. So you have to pace yourself and you have to decide, you know, how much can I do realistically? Because it's a lot of work and it's slow going. You don't see results right away. So also, um, Tom Bradder mentions that when these kids do turn around, which many of them will, they're going to need aggressive advocacy to get access to challenging opportunities because they've burned so many bridges and they've done so poorly in the past that you know, people who are running advanced courses or the universities are going to be very reluctant to give them a shot. So they're really going to need uh, aggressive advocacy. Mentor relationships are strongly recommended for these kids for a number of reasons, one of which is that they're not motivated by your typical teacher rewards. They're really interested in a relationship. So mentorships are a good way um, to go. Now regarding this subset of kids who are antisocial, let me just check my time. Okay, if, if I do it very quickly, I think I can touch on this. Anyway, just what you need to know is the intervention for this group is quite different, although it's still confrontation, but it needs to be very structured, and it's focusing on their cognition. So these are kids, the kids who are breaking the rules repeatedly. Don't you wonder sometimes how come this kid's not learning? He's so smart, and he keeps breaking the same rule over again, or he keeps having negative consequences and goes through the same motions? It's because they're making thinking errors. It's called thinking errors. They don't take responsibility. They blame. They make excuses. And so what they need is a very targeted intervention, and it's quite effective, even with some of the most hardened kids. They need targeted intervention that focuses on their uh, thinking errors. And there are, I don't have time today to talk about programs that do that, but there are some researched programs that have been quite successful at turning the thinking around for that group of kids. And if you're interested, we can chat during coffee and I can share some of that about. All right, let's go on and talk about the type fives, because I just have about 15 minutes left and I've got two profiles to cover. Uh, so type fives, you know, I'm doing a workshop this afternoon, doing it twice. Uh, there's a lot of interest. I, when we first proposed the profiles 25 years ago, twice exceptional was a brand new term. 
And now there's a lot of interest in twice exceptionality, and we know a lot about it. So this is the profile that's changed the most in 25 years because there's been so much research done on this particular group. So you know who these kids are. These are kids who are gifted, but they also have some kind of disability. So they're, they're gifted, and they have autism spectrum disorder. They're gifted, and they have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. They're gifted, and they're clinically depressed, whatever. But they've got several things going on. And Really, we want to say multi-exceptional because most kids, if you have one thing going on, you've got three or four things going on. So we've had a very exciting time. This is the most heterogeneous profile. And one of the challenges of trying to describe them is that there are huge differences between a gifted kid with autism and a gifted kid with a specific learning disability. You know, the way you teach social skills to a kid with attention deficit disorder is a lot different than how you teach social skills to a kid with autism. So when it comes down to intervention, the interventions are really specific to executive functions or to the disorder. So I can't say too specifically that here are some interventions that will work across the board because they're, they're not that way. So what we did with this type 5 profile is we tried to highlight the commonalities. So just be aware of that, that the profile as we describe it in the uh, matrix, the handout that you got too, is, is not that comprehensive. Um, okay. Oh, I've got to come back to that. Let's see. Okay. One of the key distinctions that, that, that differentiates these... Uh, gifted kids, these twice exceptional kids from other gifted kids, is that twice exceptional kids have a perception that they have failed in school. They see themselves as a failure. Now, I do think this is changing. Uh, schools are doing a much better job of supporting some of these kids than they were 20 years ago. But these are kids who have a lot of negative characteristics. They're prone to discouragement. They have feelings of learned helplessness. They're seriously underachieving often. They're depressed. If they're a teenager, they're pro very likely depressed or at least clinically anxious. The incidence of social and emotional difficulties in this profile is much higher than in any other profile. In fact, I often have said to parents, if your child is a twice exceptional child who hasn't received any kind of differentiated intervention for several years and now they're a teenager, chances are very good they're either clinically depressed or clinically anxious. And as a clinician, when I work with parents of younger children who maybe are getting diagnosed at age eight or nine, uh, one of the things I will not the first meeting, but we'll warn them about, or at least be cautious about, is the importance of monitoring the child developmentally, because if you get diagnosed with some kind of disability at age 9 or 10, the chances are very good, not guaranteed, but very good that you're going to develop another kind of difficulty in the next few years. Because typically, this is called comorbidity. You see this difficulties cluster. So for example, 60%, 60 of kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder also have a learning disability of some kind. So you have to keep an eye on things. You have to monitor that as well. So their characteristics really contribute to their low academic self-concept, their mood problems, and their behavior uh, difficulties. Now, in terms of identification, uh, this is something that's really changed markedly in the last 25 years. And in the early 80s and 90s, when I was in my training to become a uh, psychologist, what we did was profile analysis. That's how we identified these kids, profile analysis. You looked at their test scores to see how much scatter it's called, how many differences, how big was the difference. And if the gap was big enough, say, between their achievement score and their IQ score or among their IQ scores, then you identified them with a learning disability of some kind. Well, we now know that that kind of approach to identifying difficulties is seriously flawed, psychometrically and theoretically. I think I'm not going into the details of it. You have it in your hand out there. But there are several reasons why uh, they are flawed, and so that's not the recommendation. Uh, instead, this is kind of uh, very similar to response to intervention, if you're familiar with that framework. What you want to look for over time, you want to look for a pattern of superior ability and a pattern of declining performance in spite of intervention. And you want to, in particular, focus on classroom-based assessments, uh, especially domain-specific. So writing samples, reading inventories, uh, portfolio reviews of their work, so that you can really see what their performance over time looks like. And of course, one of the big challenges to identifying these kids is that sometimes their ability masks their low performance. They do fine through primary school. 
because they're so smart and the expectations aren't very high and they don't really start to have serious difficulties and fall behind until they become a teenager, by which time patterns of frustration and learned helplessness have set in. So it becomes much more complicated to intervene. And some kids, their disability really masks their, their um, superior ability. So we see, we get identified at age eight or seven maybe that this child's dyslexic. We don't realize that the child's got um, an intelligence level that's in the far superior range because their inability to read captures so much of our attention and interferes with their output, what they can accomplish in class. So you really have to watch what they're doing in the classroom and focus on that classroom-based uh, intervention. Uh, the big takeaway, though, is um, that in terms of support, and I'm going to talk about this in the workshop a little bit this afternoon, is that it's really a paradigm shift for which teachers are not well prepared, that we want to focus, instead of focusing on what they cannot do, you want to focus on what they can do. So the framework for intervention is to develop the strengths while accommodating the disability. What we've done historically in many countries is we've tried to remediate the weakness while doing what we can on the side to keep them happy and engaged in school. We put a lot of emphasis on remediation. We want to turn that around instead. So the goal is to develop their strength and their abilities while accommodating that disability. So you also have to provide some intervention to assist them with their social and emotional and behavioral concerns and that's often what captures people's attention because they're just having so much trouble. And I'm, I, I don't have time this morning in the keynote to go into the details of this. I am going to cover that in quite a bit of detail in the breakout this afternoon. Um, okay, uh, just, just for your information too that Let's see if I want to. Uh, some studies that looked at who succeeds, right, this is what we're going to talk about in the workshop, what works, who succeeds. When they define success in the research studies, it's kids who graduate from the university. That's how they operationally define success. Who succeeds? When they looked at some uh, studies of who is twice exceptional and succeeds, the factors that were most strongly associated with enduring achievement the factors that were most strongly associated with long-term achievement were social and emotional, those competencies. Really important for kids with autism. We'll talk about this afternoon. It's not the academic and it's not the thinking. That to succeed long-term, you have to have those social and emotional competencies. All right, I better go on to the type six or we're not gonna get done. These are the kids, the type sixes are the autonomous learner. These are the kids who have really taken off. They are soaring. They are just soaring. When we first proposed this profile 25 years ago, we used broad general descriptors like uh, self-directed, well-respected, independent, and secure, achieving. We have learned a lot uh, in the last 20 years about some of the specific cognitive processes and the talent development processes that have enabled these kids. These kids are goal setters. They are persevering through adversity. Setbacks do not throw them off course. They are able to embrace failure and they seek challenge. They have that growth mindset. Type sixes can look like type ones if you don't know what to look for because they're both achieving, they're both doing very well, they're well liked in school, they both have good self-concepts, but the difference is the type ones are really not interested in taking a lot of initiative. They're not working at their edge of competence, and to work at your edge of competence is where you're working with others with similar interest, ability, and drive, and you are really risking failure. Type sixes will go there. And type sixes, yeah, they want to do well in school, but it's not the end point for them. In fact, you might get a little frustrated with these kids because if their passion lies outside of the core curriculum, they're doing what they need to do in school to kind of keep people off their backs so that they have time to pursue their passion area. And that's really where they're investing their energy. And sometimes teachers don't like that, that the child doesn't really apply their ability to school, but it's not their top priority. So they have an adaptive, uh, adaptive mindset, a positive explanatory style, uh, which in turn associates with greater effort, of course, so they do very well. well uh, we know from the literature that these kids have really mastered some skills for self-regulation, and they're kind of intrigued with that, and there's a danger that we can think that they don't uh, need anything from us, um, even though because it looks like they're doing so well, we might think that they figured everything out, they figured out how to manage their stress level, they don't really complain about anything, they seem to be coping well. Um, consequently, they're more consistent in their performance, but the literature really does point to 
uh, some do's and don'ts for home and school intervention for this profile. They, it's not actually that they need less support. In fact, they probably need more support, but they need a different kind of support than your type ones do or your other profiles. If they're already operating at a high level of performance at age 15 or 16 or 17, in whatever domain it is, then they're going to need help with things like managing the social and psychological costs of their success. Right? High achievement has a price. There's often a social cost and often a, a psychological cost as well. And it's, it's nice to know that ahead of time and not be surprised by that, that everybody's not going to celebrate your success. Now, that's really more true in a Western context, in, a, in an Asian context. When I first moved into my neighborhood in Singapore, one of the things that I was fascinated with, I think you'll be intrigued by this too, is that we had just finished having some high-stake national exams. And in my local neighborhood, on big banners, big banners like the size of this slide uh, screen right here, hanging above my street, was a larger-than-life, full-size picture of the kid who had topped out the score from our neighborhood. And everybody was like, yeah, from our neighborhood! And on the school, the local school, every child who had been among the top scores, their picture, you know, about this high and this wide, was posted on the wall of the school with their marks. <laughs> this kid did this, and this kid got five A's, and this kid over here. I thought, wow, that would so never happen in America. <laughs> child would go out and shoot themselves if anybody put their picture up. And at the age of 12, at the age of 12, if you are a top scorer on the national exam, you get endorsements and your name is on a billboard where you tell people what you ate the week that you took your exam. Right? You get to endorse certain products. So in, those, in a collectivist society, the group celebrates your achievement. But that's not true in an individualistic society so much. There are much more costs to your uh, your success. So they need to become more adept at, well at managing themselves. As you move along the trajectory from achievement to high achievement to elite levels of performance, as, you know, as competition intensifies and stakes rise, so does stress and so does anxiety. And what worked for you at age 14 is probably not going to work for you at age 17 because what worked for you when you were just competing within your neighborhood or your school is maybe not going to work for you so well when you're competing internationally. The stakes are a lot higher. So you're going to need help managing that. Um, and they're going to need to cultivate a support team because there's a lot of social support that's needed for talent development, and particularly as you make those later transitions. They're going to need mentors and cultural brokers to help them with the shift in expectation that comes when you move out of a school setting into more of a community or the domain, your professional domain. So. Type, well, I think type 1s work for some performance goals, um, and whereas type 6s work for more mastery goals. Okay, so in summary, just to kind of wrap some things up and then raise some questions that we're thinking about, we've had major changes to uh, all the profiles, but uh, the type 2s have changed the least, largely because there hasn't been as much research on the creative, high creative achievement. And we know much more about type 5s and type 6s in particular. Um, I've asked myself since moving to Asia eight years ago, you know, how relevant are these profiles to collectivist societies? I'm still learning a lot about this. One of the things I'm learning, I just recently in fact doing some work around the construction of the self. And I know that in, at least from talking to some of you, that in the Netherlands, uh, really education starts, focus, initial focus is on the self and the person of the child and is this person, who is this person and are you well adjusted, etc. And you're an individualistic society, just like America's an individualistic society. But in collectivist societies, the self is constructed differently. Let me just give you a few examples. The self in an individualistic society uh, is taught to influence others. Okay? And your, the goal of development in your own families, the goal of development is to separate and individuate, right? That's the goal of adolescence, is to separate from your parents and become your own person. That is not the goal in collectivist societies. And as a clinician, I, and training local psychologists in Singapore, I had to learn this. The goal is to learn to reciprocate. You do not separate. If you are not married, you stay at home. You live with your parents, even if you're 50 years old. Imagine people if you've never left home and you're still living, your grandparents, your parents, and your, um, 
your, your sister, your siblings, you're all still in the house together and you haven't left yet. I mean, very, most people do not leave. There's something wrong with leaving. If you want to leave at age 25 and you're not married, there's something wrong with you. It's, a, it's suspect. Okay? So it's group reference. But the goal in individualistic societies is to influence others. In a collectivist society, it's to adapt to others. Okay? It's not about influencing, it's about adapting. In individualistic Western societies in particular, we tend to value high emotion. Our desired affect is a high arousal affect. We want to feel joy and enthusiasm and excitement. Those are the emotions that we desire. In a collectivist society, particularly in Asia, those are not the desired affects. Peace, calmness, serenity are the desired affects. So as a result, self shapes your thoughts and your feelings, right, yourself. And so there are big differences, big differences in, uh, I think, in these profiles, uh, big differences in children's development. So I'm imagining that, uh, I'm not sure how relevant these profiles would be in some collectivist societies, since that environment shapes it. Uh, We've been able to improve on the accuracy, I think, of the profiles. It's a lot more aligned with the uh, empirical research. I think going forward, what I would predict is that we're gonna see a lot more details regarding the interventions, the specific interventions. Uh, I've been working on this for about three years now. I think I'm really interested in what we know about the psychosocial variables that influence talent development. How do you really help kids to make those transitions to higher levels of achievement? Uh, a question that George and I are often asked that I don't know the answer to is, is there a developmental progression to the profiles? Parents will sometimes say, my child was a type 2 when he was in primary school, but now he's a type 4. Is it related? And I don't know. I don't know if it's related. I, I think so. Maybe it makes sense that it might be, but we're really not sure. The goal, of course, is for all the kids, what we're working for is that the kids will become a type six, that more and more kids will be effective at developing their talent to that level. And I, I think we'll get there, but I think it may take us a good another decade. I look forward to engaging with you today and tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to conversations over coffee and lunch. Hope a chance, I hope I get a chance to meet many of you and to hear what you're learning, what you're thinking about and where you think things are going. Thanks so much for your attention this morning.